Well, good morning, everyone, and let me extend to you my greetings. Thank you for joining us today, whether you are in the studio, watching online, or are here in our worship center. And before we go any further, I just want to offer a uh, qualification. I know that if you are a Mavericks fan and even a Stars fan, you're, you're sleep deprived this week because of all the late games. So if by chance you nod off during my message, I want to give the person next to you my permission to jab you in the ribs and wake you back up. So uh, we'll get going. But it's a great time to live in North Texas, right, with all the good stuff going on. Well, today we continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount, and our subtitle has been The Surprising Path to a Good Life. And we're really going to be focusing on one of the most important principles to have that kind of good life. And I want to just give you a brief overview of where we have been as we have been in chapter 6 of Matthew. And verses 1 through 18, Jesus has been encouraging us to keep our motives pure when we are practicing three important spiritual disciplines, whether it's giving to the poor or fasting or praying. And he encourages us not to do them publicly so that we might be more esteemed by our peers. He encourages us to do them privately so we might be then blessed by God. Well, today we're going to turn to verses 19 through 24 in chapter 6, and we're going to look at another means by which we often seek to be more esteemed by our peers, and that is through the accrual of wealth and the things of the world. And in Jesus' typical style, he's going to show us another way to channel our ambition and our desires to get ahead in life. Now go ahead, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 or your device, wherever it is. But here's what I want you to do. I'm not going to read the text that you can find on your particular device. My favorite New Testament scholar, Frederick uh, Bruner, is, has done a beautiful job translating this. In the same way that Eugene Peterson has done the message, he has done his own translation of this text and I think it really hits where we are today better than any other translation like the New Living or the NIV. And so I'm just going to read this to you first, and then we'll kind of break it down as we go. But hear the words of Jesus as translated by Frederick Bruner, and I think you'll see how applicable it is. Here is what he says. Don't keep making big investments for yourselves here on earth, where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break in and steal. Instead, make big investments for yourselves in heaven, where neither moth nor rust corrupt and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your investment is, there will be your heart as well. The light of the body is the eye, so if your eye is sound, your whole body will be luminous. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be darkness. And if then that which is supposed to be light in you turns out to be darkness, what a great darkness that is. No one can serve two lords because he will either hate one of them and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and look down on the other. You cannot serve God and gain. Now, when I read this passage, I think of one of my favorite leadership quotes by Max Dupree. Here's what he says. The first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. And in these six verses, this is exactly what Jesus does. He is defining for us in a truthful manner the way life really works. And he only gives us one loving encouragement based on that real take on reality. So let's dig in and see what Jesus has to say. Now, he does not say this explicitly, but it is implicitly applied. And it's really what holds everything together. And here's the truth. To live is to invest. To live is to invest. 
from our earliest conscious moments, we spend either our time or our attention or our energy or any available resource to get a preferred return, to get some kind of payoff. For example, the infant crying in the crib is using their time and their energy to cry loudly, the only resource they have, to try to get mom and dad's attention or to get some food. They're investing that energy in order to get a payoff. Or the 10 year old practicing shooting goals in the backyard so that the kids down the street might invite them to play soccer too. Or a middle school girl practicing overtime, long hours for an upcoming audition for the school play. Or a freshman in high school saving money that they've been earning babysitting or mowing lawns so they can get their first car. Or a junior in high school studying on the weekends so they can do well on their SAT and get into the college of their choice. By the time we leave home, we have already made thousands of decisions about how to invest our time and our energy and our attention and whatever resources we have. And we will continue to make literally thousands of choices the rest of our life about how to invest our time, our attention, our energy, and our resources. And here's the thing. The sweeter the return on any of those investments, the higher we'll value it. That is, if we invest in something and we get affirmation or we get some kind of reward, the more response back, the more highly we will value those things. And that's why Jesus says, you're going to invest in the things you value. In verse 21, we read these words, for where your investment is, some translations say where your treasures are, or your treasure is, there will be your heart also. Now, in New Testament thinking, your heart is the seat of your emotion and your wills. And when you value something, it directly affects your desires and your decisions. Now, Jesus is not making a judgment here. He's simply stating the fact of the isness of life. If you simply observe how someone invests their time and their energy and their attention, their resources, you will be able to discern what they value the most. That is, if you could look at my social media history and you could look at my calendar and you could look at my Quicken ledger, you would know beyond the shadow of a doubt what is most important to me and how I am investing. And that's what Jesus is saying. You're going to invest in the things that you value the most. And your calendar and your social media history and your ledger reveals exactly what you value. Now, after Jesus says that, he goes on, and I believe his intention is to warn us against three perilous investment decisions. Here's the first one. He warns us not to make big investments in what will not last. Again, the text, verse 19, don't, don't keep making big investments for yourselves here on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break in and steal. Jesus is reminding us that many of the things in which we invest time, energy, resources, and money are temporal. They are very vulnerable. That is, your career may command most all of your time and energy in life, and yet your career can be wiped out in an instant by AI in the days to come. Or your company might merge with another one, and guess what? Your department is no longer needed. Or you get a little older and you reach retirement age and you were asked to hand it on to the next generation. And you've invested all of your life in that. You've made your biggest investment in that, and that career is temporal, it's vulnerable. The stock market, many of us 
have a lot depending on the stock market. And yet I went back and looked, remember the dot-com bust? And a lot of people are saying, hey, we could have the AI bust. And the dot-com bust, the stock market lost 78% of its value. Real estate, we invest in that. Real estate prices can crash and properties can burn. And here's the thing that concerns me. Do you know that in 2020, citizens in the United States, 60 and over, lost almost $1 billion with a B in internet scams. Think of that. The things that we invest in, in this earth, many of them are incredibly vulnerable and they are temporal. So here's what I think Jesus wants us to know. If you assign ultimate value to vulnerable and temporal investments, there is a high likelihood you're going to end up disappointed at best and hopeless at worst. Here's the second one. He says, beware, do not make big investments in what cannot fulfill you. That's his whole conversation about the eye. The light of the body is the eye. So if your eye is sound, your whole body will be luminous. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be darkness. And if then that which is supposed to be light in you turns out to be darkness, what a great darkness that is. Jesus is saying it's not just what you see, but how you see things that is determined by your eye or your perspective. If your eye is clear, you see things as they truly are, and therefore you can make wise and thoughtful decisions. But if your eye is jaded, you will not see things as they truly are, and you may end up seeing and valuing things that are not worth what they pretend to be worth, and they do not hold up, and they do not ultimately fulfill the things of the earth. I was uh, looking for a story to really kind of bring this home, and I was just going back through some of my internet files, and I came across an email that I got from my friend Michael O'Gwen back in 2018. And he wrote me about an insight that he had and about a friend of his that he was concerned about. He said, Jim Don was a close friend of mine from high school and college, and he passed away on Saturday due to liver failure because of his alcoholism. Don and I spent a lot of time together in the early 80s, and he told me his goals were to go to Harvard Business School, get rich, and retire with a beautiful wife at 40. So after undergrad, he indeed was admitted to Harvard Business School, he then went to Wall Street to sell fixed income securities to institutional investors. He made millions and he retired at 42. He just missed his goal by two years and he married a beautiful woman just before he retired. Don played a lot of golf in his retirement. He enjoyed the San Diego social scene and always told me how great his life was. But I could tell he was miserable. He was bored and had nothing to live for so he drank. 15 years later, he finally confessed to me that he never enjoyed his job. It was not intellectually challenging. His wife had found God, started volunteering in her church. She gave up alcohol in her own life. And because of his alcoholism, she left him the year before he passed away. And their divorce was almost final. And here's what he said. Don was hostile to the idea of religion. He would say, religion is the opiate of the masses. But when he got seriously ill, I wanted to go see him. And I wanted to talk to him about a relationship with God and the afterlife. And when I finally got out to see him, he was not able to speak. And I felt somewhat inadequate trying to lead him to put his trust in God in that moment. He says, I, I was reading Philippians chapter 4 this week where it talks about rejoicing in God and I thought about Don. He said, if I were in a hospital room with multiple organ failure, I'd be thinking that this was a little speed bump within the great eternity of everlasting life. However, Don was in misery and had little or no hope. That would be a very terrible place to be. He was a smart guy. He set out to achieve some really big 
and great goals supposedly and had the superficial displays of success. But his life shows how empty it can be without God and a purpose. Little did Michael know when he wrote me that, that 16 months later, he would be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And in four months, he would hit that little speed bump in his own life on his journey to eternity. But his passing was much different than his friend Don's. Uh, Mike was in our small group. And we walked with him through that whole experience in 2020. And just a couple of weeks before he died, we were literally sitting on his back patio and we went around the circle. And we told Michael how much we loved him and we listened to him tell us how much he loved us and cared for us. And I guarantee you, it was a matter of fact in his life. This was just a speed bump to him. And he was able to be that way because he invested in something that could fulfill. And his eye was clear and not jaded. Here's the third thing that Jesus says to be aware of. Oh, well, before I go on, he, he, there's something that, there's a verse in Proverbs that I wanna make sure that you get. It's Proverbs 14, 12. And here's what it says. There is a way that seems right to a man but in the end, it leads to death. And in our culture today, it is so easy to think that the way of our culture is the right way. But Jesus is saying, don't make big investments in the things that cannot fulfill. Now, here's the third. He says, don't invest or try to make your biggest investments in two places. And here's the very familiar passage. No one can serve two lords because he either will hate one of them and love the other or he'll be devoted to one of them and look down on the other. You cannot serve God and gain. Now that word gain is from the Greek word mammon, which can mean wealth or money or all the possessions and things that go with it along the way. And here's what Jesus recognizes, is that we will order our lives around. We will define our lives based on what we value the most. That is, you will end up serving your ultimate value, whatever you value the highest, and it will affect every aspect of your life. It will become the highest criterion, the most important one for every decision. But here's what Jesus is saying. You cannot have two competing ultimate values. You can only have one. And if you try to have two, you will live in perpetual conflict and you will not know shalom. Now let me sh share with you kind of an illustration or two about what Jesus is trying to say. He says, you're going to serve some ultimate value. Well, what does that mean? Well, think about people who serve in the military. Many of you have done so, and I wanna thank you for your service, but you know, if you enlist, or if you get drafted like people did in my, in my younger years, you are now, you belong to the U.S. Army, right? And now because you serve them, the Army is going to determine when you get up and when you go to bed. It's gonna determine what you wear and what you don't wear. It's gonna determine where you live and what you do. It will determine who you're gonna hang out with and who you won't hang out with. And all the while, your life is no longer your own. You have a master, and it's the United States Army, okay? All right, so for example, you are serving gain or money, or wealth, or the American dream in that regard. If that is your ultimate value, it's gonna determine and influence what you wear and what you don't wear. It will shape when you get up and when you go to bed. It will dictate where you're gonna live and what you're gonna do in your life. And it will influence who you hang out with and who you don't. And you will think that the life that you live belongs to you, but it doesn't. You have a master and it's money. 
On the other hand, if God and the things of God are your highest value, it may influence what you wear or don't wear. It will influence when you get up and when you go to bed. If God is the ultimate value in your life, it may determine where you live and what you do, who you hang out with and who you don't. And you will think perhaps that your life is your own, but it is not. You have a master. And so in life, we have one really big choice. Who do we want to be our master? Someone who loves us, has shown us grace and mercy who gave his son for us? Or do we want it to be money and the things of the world? And that is the choice that we get to make. You see, trying to serve two masters will only ultimately lead to the fragmentation, not the salvation of your soul. And only when we make the love and the grace and the kingdom of God our ultimate value will we find wholeness and completeness in this life and the life to come. So those are the three things that Jesus warns us against. Now, here's the best investment advice you're ever gonna get. Hey, and the good news is it's free today, okay? Free investment advice, here it is, it's verse 21. Instead, make big investments for yourselves in heaven, where neither moth nor rust corrupt and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now, I want you to note something very important here. Jesus' sentiment is not, hey, I want to get something from you. He is really saying, I want something for you. He says, don't make, only make big investments for yourselves in heaven. You see, Jesus recognizes the human condition that for us to live is to invest and we're going to invest in things that there is a return for, there is a payoff for. And here's what he's saying. If you want the best return on your life investments, invest in heaven, invest in the things of God. So make your biggest investments in heaven is his investment advice. Great, well, what does that mean, right? And how do you actually make investments in heaven? That's a really good question. And throughout the New Testament, we discover what those are. I think there are three ways that we can invest in heaven. And I think what Jesus is saying, to invest in heaven means to invest in the things of God. In the same way, when it says, don't let for yourselves treasures on earth, we know that those treasures are things like money and possessions and stuff. So when we invest in things of heaven, he's talking about the things, the values of God in the world, all right? So here's the three things we can invest in. First, invest in your relationship with God. That's the beginning place. My original, my very first mentor was a pastor by the name of Marshall Edwards. And he taught me something about relationships I haven't forgotten in over 40 years. He says, relationships are living things. When you nurture them over time and give them your attention and you inject energy into them and you use your resources for them, you will have rich relationships. And if you don't do these things, you won't have good relationships. And that's certainly been true in my marriage when I pay attention to my wife and when I spend time with her and when I invest energy in that relationship, our relationship is highly satisfying. But if I, thank you, when I fail, to, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> when I don't do that, it is not very satisfying in all kinds of ways you might think, okay? So, <laughs> now where was I? You guys totally got me off. <laughs> all right. The way we invest in our relationship with God is not dissimilar at all. It is spending time with him, investing energy. It is time across our lives. And when I was 17, I read a book that has really transformed my spiritual life. And I've lived by this principle for a long, long time. It's from a little book written by a Carmelite monk in the early 1600s, and it's called Practicing the Presence of God. And here's what he says about practicing the presence of God. 
Practicing the presence of God consists in taking delight in and becoming accustomed to God's divine company. Speaking humbly and conversing lovingly with him all the time, at every moment, especially in times of temptation, suffering, aridity, weariness, even infidelity and sin. And what I learned in that reading, and I've tried to live out sometimes better than others, is to invite God's presence and live with the constant awareness that he is present with me when I wake up in the morning, when I get into the shower, when I go do my work of the day, when I spend time with my family and others, he is the unseen presence and guest, and I invite him into my world as often as I can. And I'm whispering prayers and speaking to him all along the way, thanking him for what I'm experiencing this morning, whatever. And here's the thing, when you begin to invite him into every moment, you're living a relationship with him. My richest relationship is with my wife, my hum richest human relationship, and it's because I spend a lot of time with her and I'm inviting her into my thoughts and my life every day and you can have that same kind of relationship, but you have to invite God into your life every moment of every day in every experience of your life. But here's the thing, you do that. You're not investing in your relationship with God to get him to love you to get him to love you more, you're inviting him into, you're investing in your relationship with him so that his love will transform you. That's why you do it. He already loves you. It's just that when you invite him in, you're gonna be transformed by his incredible love. Here's the second thing. Invest in the relationships with people God loves. You're gonna invest in a relationship with God, now invest in relationships with the people God loves. Well, who does that include? Well, it includes your family and your friends and your fellow believers and your neighbors and even your enemies. You know, it's been said that you can't take anything with you when you die. That's false. You can take your relationships with you when you die. And C.S. Lewis helped me understand that a long time ago when I read a portion of his book called The Weight of Glory, and this is what he says. He says, it's hardly possible for us to think too often or too deeply about the glory of our neighbor. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. It is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit, and these people will be immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. But everyone that you meet, everyone is in this circle of your influence. You have the possibility of having an eternal relationship. And so what God calls you to do is to invest in them, time, energy, love, resources, to care for them. And here's the thing. Your friends should not feel like you want something from them. The people you invest in should feel like you are doing everything you can to give something for them. And then after you meet with them, that they should feel like they are richer <laughs> and their life is more meaningful for having met you, been with you, spent time with you. And here's the third thing you invest in. Invest financially in the purposes of God. Standing behind this whole discussion that Jesus is having is the consideration of where you're going to invest your money, your worth, your wealth. And what Jesus is saying, stop making your biggest financial investments in the trappings of wealth. <clears throat> Homes or camels in that day, it'd be cars in our day, clothing or travel or toys. But he's saying, make eternal investments in the purposes of God in the world. And God is most at work in the world through his body, the church. And so when you see God at work in one of his bodies and you see lives being changed and families and marriages being restored and you see children being nurtured and hearts and minds being made whole and the poor cared for, that's God's work in the world. And if you value him, that's where you want to invest. And when you invest in God's purposes in the world, you're revealing that you value what he is doing in the lives of people. And you want to facilitate it so he can do more of the same. 
As a matter of fact, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 17, the apostle Paul picks up on what Jesus says, and he actually says that we have accounts in heaven. After the people in Philippi had supported him, helped him, cared for him, this is what he writes. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. Paul is even, he's kind of picturing that all these believers in Philippi, they have accounts in heaven with numbers. And so when they invest in the purposes of God, you know, ding, 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 it's going up. That is, they are literally investing in heaven. So that's Jesus' best investment advice. Invest in your relationship with him and the people he loves and his purposes in the world. So why is his investment advice the best you'll ever receive? Well, first, your investments, these investments will never be lost. These investments will make an impact in God's mission of reconciling other people to himself around the world, and you will be blessed and rewarded with greater resources so that you can indeed invest in God's great mission again. Now, here's what I want you to pick up on and see. Reciprocity is the motivation that drives a faithful life in Christ. It's all through the New Testament. We love God because he first loved us. We forgive others because we have been radically forgiven. We graciously accept other people no matter who they are or what their story is because we have been graciously accepted in Christ. We give generously because we have received freely. We value God and the people he loves and his purposes in the world because he valued us enough to send his son Jesus to die for us and make a way for us to be reconciled to him, to be restored, to be made whole, to be given a future both in this life and the life to come. There's an old hymn that has meant so much to me through the years that shaped me and really speaks to this. It's the hymn, When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross. And in one of the verses, it says, all the vain things that charm me most all the things of the earth that have charmed me most, I sacrifice to his blood. And what I want to do, this, this old hymn, the lyrics can just really begin to stir your heart in a new way. So Warren and Chelsea are gonna sing that. And I invite you to just go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes. And after they sing, I'm gonna come back and we'll wrap up. The service is not over. And I, I would encourage you, please, don't leave because if you walk by someone, you might disturb them. And I believe God wants to do serious business in our hearts today. But may the singing of these words, been here for a long, long time, may the Spirit use them to create a wondrous shift in your heart today. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride Thorns compose 
so rich a crown were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small the soul Father, may that amazing love flow into our lives this day, and may it grip our minds and hearts and spirits and souls. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I can truthfully say that I would not be here today if it were not for the last verse of that hymn. When I was in high school and deciding what I would do for my life, that last verse meant so much to me. And God's love for me was so clear. It was such an amazing love that it demanded my soul and my life and my all. And uh, I was grateful to be able to say yes. And my hope and prayer for each one of you is that that kind of love will be so evident to you and you can respond with soul heart life all that you have now i just want to invite our simple response to the message today there are two the first one is simply this some of you need to change your investment strategy truth to be told if people could see all the things your social media account and your calendar and your ledger they they could discern, as God does, that you are more highly invested in the things of the world and you are headed for ultimate disappointment and perhaps hopelessness along the way. And God does not want that for you. He wants you to have life and meaning and purpose. So today, maybe you just need to change your entire investment strategy and say, Lord, I'm gonna start investing most of my life, my whole life is gonna be in you. However you want me to use it, give it to you, share it with you. But I'm gonna start investing. My ultimate value is gonna be in the things that you say are important in you. So if that's a decision you can make right where you're sitting and say, yep, I'm in, I'm changing my investment strategy. Another one is simply this. Some of you can take your next step in beginning to become a growing investor in God's purposes. We're all on a journey of generosity and investing along the way. Did you know that across the United States, in every church, half the people who attend never invest in that church's mission? That's just kind of a standard database. And some of you may be new to the faith and you're kind of here and you're just saying, yeah, you know what, that's kind of me. I've never had a sense of the value of this before, but maybe I could be a potential investor. So we put together like a, just kind of a, a basic investment journey thing. And some of you may be here today and you're going, I'm potential, I wanna know more. I'd like to know what that means for me to invest in the mission of the church. And in a few moments, I'm gonna give you a website that will give you the information that you know how to do that. Some of you now, as a result of that, may become a first time investor in God's purposes through Preston Trail because you believe in what God is doing here. Others of you might want to move from just being a first-time investor to being someone who invests on a regular basis so that what we do here can be expanded both in our community in North Texas and around the world. And some of you, maybe for you, it's simply to become a growing investor, to become one, someone who tithes, who gives 10% as the Old and New Testament talk about. Maybe it's giving way beyond in terms of a legacy gift, whatever that is. I don't know where you are in the journey but there's a lot of grace for us in that journey, but I just wanna invite you, as you look at that, to find where you are on that journey and then just be willing to move to the right, just one step. 
And as you do so, know that what you're doing is you are investing in the things of God and he will bless that and reward that and you will experience even greater blessings along the way. If you'd like more information about giving or how to become a growing investor, just go to prestontrail.org slash give. We have a new giving page there that explains a lot of things for you and that will bless you as you do so. Well, whenever we talk about important lifetime things, uh, it always kind of triggers other thoughts and desires and questions. And whether you are in the studio or whether you're here, there's a cross there where there'll be people there prepared to pray for you, no matter what you're walking through. And uh, it would be their privilege today to serve you in that way. You don't want to miss next Sunday. We're continuing. And some of the difficult, hard things that Jesus has to say, but in them is a truth that can change your life. I hope you'll be back next week and bring a friend. So as we dismiss today, would you stand? I would like to express a blessing over each one of us. And here it is. May God's love for you and his grace toward you compel you this week to invest more in your relationship with him, the people that he loves, and his purposes in the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.